Dear Patriots, before the news starts, please, subscribe to our patriotic channel by clicking the subscribe button. Give us a thumbs up to this video. Don't forget to leave your opinion below in the comments section. Share the news on Facebook and Twitter so you friends see it. Thank you. Stunning new Starzok texts reveal the Obama admin's orchestration of the Russia witch hunt. The disgraced FBI can't hide from the shocking text messages written by anti-Trump agent Starzok to his mistress, Lisa Page. Now, we're learning that Obama's ties to the start of the Russian witch hunt are deeper and stronger than ever. Newly released text message suggests that Obama, Reid, CIA, and other deep state operatives were pulling the Russia probe strings very early on. From Fox News Newly uncovered text messages between FBI officials Peter Strzok and Lisa Page suggest a possible coordination between high-ranking officials at the Obama White House, CIA, FBI, Justice Department and former Senate Democratic leadership in the early stages of the investigation into alleged collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia according to GOP congressional investigators on Wednesday. The investigators say the information provided to Fox News strongly suggests coordination between former President Barack Obama's chief of staff Dennis McDonough, then-Senate Democratic leader Harry Reid, and CIA Director John Brennan, which they say would contradict the Obama administration's public stance about its hand in the process. Page texted Strzok on August 2, 2016, saying, Make sure you can lawfully protect what you sign. Just thinking about Congress, though yeah, etc. you probably know better than me. A text message from Strzok to Page on August 3rd described former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe as being concerned with information control related to the initial investigation into the Trump campaign. According to a report from The New York Times, Brennan was sent to Capitol Hill around the same time to brief members of Congress on the possibility of election interference. Days later, on August 8, 2016, Strzok texted Page, Internal Joint Cyber CD Intel Peace 4D, Senior Setter for McDonough Brief, Trainer, Head of FBI Cyber Division, directed all cyber info be pulled. I'd let Bill and Jim hammer it out first, though it would be best for D to have it before the wet WH session. In the texts, D referred to FBI Director James Comey, and N. McDonough referred to Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough, the GOP investigators said. We are not making conclusions. What we are saying is that the timeline is concerning enough to warrant the appointment of an independent investigator to look at whether or not the Obama White House was involved, in the Trump-Russia investigation, a GOP congressional source told Fox News. An FBI spokesman did not immediately respond to Fox News' request for comment. The congressional investigators pointed out to Fox News that the CIA and FBI are supposed to be independent agencies, and noted that coordination between political actors at the White House and investigators would be inappropriate, raising questions about the level of involvement of Obama White House officials. But weeks later, on August 25, 2016, Brennan went to Capitol Hill to brief Harry Reid, and it was unclear whether FBI officials attended the briefing, a congressional source told Fox News. Two days after the briefing, Reid penned a letter to Comey requesting an investigation into potential collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. The evidence of a direct connection between the Russian government and Donald Trump's presidential campaign continues to mount and has led Michael Morell, the former acting Central Intelligence Director, to call Trump an unwitting agent of Russia and the Kremlin, Reid, a Nevada Democrat, wrote. The prospect of a hostile government actively seeking to undermine our free and fair elections represents one of the gravest threats to our democracy since the Cold War and it is critical for the Federal Bureau of Investigation to use every resource available to investigate this matter thoroughly and in a timely fashion. Reid cited reports in his letter noting methods Russia was using to influence the Trump campaign and manipulate it as a vehicle for advancing the interests of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Reid added that recent staff changes within the Trump campaign have made clear that the Trump campaign has employed a number of individuals with significant and disturbing ties to Russia and the Kremlin, urging Comey to make the investigation public. The New York Times first reported on Reid's letter to Comey on August 29, 2016. The following day, 
August 30, 2016, Strzok texted Page, Here we go, sending a link to the Times report titled, Harry Reid Cites Evidence of Russian Tampering in U.S. Votes and Seeks FBI Inquiry. Strzok replied, D. Comey, said it in brief that Reid called him and told him he would be sending a letter. Congressional investigators suggested that the Reid letter possibly provided cover for the fact that the FBI and Justice Department had already begun investigating the Trump campaign in mid-July on what they called questionable ethical and legal grounds. The Here We Go text between Strzok and Page indicates the FBI, DOJ knew the letter from Reid was coming, a congressional source told Fox News. This created the inference they knew it would create public calls for an investigation into Russian interference, covering them. The source told Fox News on Wednesday that investigators were neither passing judgment nor claiming a smoking gun, but suggested that the timeline was incredibly concerning. At some point, the amount of concerning information becomes enough for a special counsel to look into it. Sound off below and let us know what you think and feel about the latest information coming out, and what should be done to combat this level of corruption and evil. The Trump admin just officially got the upper hand on both Hillary and the FBI. The Trump administration has had it with the disgraced FBI stonewalling for Hillary. AG Jeff Sessions is growing increasingly angry over how slowly the agency is moving, regarding providing Congress with information on Hillary's botched email investigation and now the FBI is finally complying by assigning 27 more agents to the case. From Washington Examiner The FBI is promising swift action on a House subpoena covering three politically charged investigations after word that Attorney General Jeff Sessions has grown angry with the Bureau's slow walking of congressional requests for information. Last week the House Judiciary Committee sent a subpoena to Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein demanding documents from the Justice Department and the FBI regarding charging decisions in the investigation surrounding former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's private email server, potential abuses of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and the FBI's Office of Professional Responsibility recommendation to fire former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe according to a committee press release. In a letter accompanying the subpoena, Chairman Bob Goodlett, Republican Virginia, told Rosenstein the committee had asked for the documents months ago and received little or nothing in response. Given the department's ongoing delays in producing these documents, I am left with no choice but to issue a subpoena to compel production of these documents, Goodlett wrote. Late Tuesday a source who asked to be identified as a DOJ insider emailed an update from inside the Justice Department, making clear Sessions has grown impatient with FBI Director Christopher Wray. Senior staff on both sides of the street have met on this and the FBI is getting called on the carpet. The Attorney General is angry with how slow the process has moved when it comes to requests from Congress to the FBI. He's told Ray that the pace is unacceptable and that if the FBI needs to double the number of people working on this, then that's what they need to do, but he is done seeing the department criticized for the FBI's slow walking of requests from Congress like the last administration when these requests should be a top priority. Sure enough, on Tuesday, Ray issued a press release promising to double the number of people working on the document request. From Ray as the director of the FBI, I am committed to ensuring that the Bureau is being transparent and responsive to legitimate congressional requests. Up until today, we have dedicated 27 FBI staff to review the records that are potentially responsive to Chairman Goodlett's requests. The actual number of documents responsive to this request is likely in the thousands. Regardless, I agree that the current pace of production is too slow. Accordingly, I am doubling the number of assigned FBI staff, for a total of 54, to cover two shifts per day from 8 a.m. to midnight to expedite completion of this project. Ray's announcement was welcome news to members of the House Committee. Welcome, but still cautiously received. Obviously that's a good sign, but I'll believe it when I see it, Rep. Jim Jordan, Republican Ohio, a member of the committee who has been pursuing the issue said in an interview Tuesday evening.
but as important as getting documents to us in a much more timely fashion is, are they going to be redacted? We know in the past that documents we have received have been redacted so much that we can't figure them out. In recent days Jordan and Rep. Mark Meadows, RNC, Chairman of the House Oversight Committee's Subcommittee on Government Operations, have been sending staff to the Justice Department to view less redacted copies of key documents in the various investigations under review. The presence of those congressional investigators sent a clear message to the Justice Department that the House was not going to give up. Now, the Justice Department is promising to do better, and the Attorney General has signaled that he is not happy with the FBI Director's performance. Now, lawmakers will wait to see what that means. Report Steve Scalise replacing Paul Ryan is becoming a real possibility. Imagine how amazing it would be to have a pro-Trump Speaker of the House. It almost seems like a fairy tale, but if this latest report is true, it could very well be a reality. Pro-Trump Congressman Steve Scalise, who was shot last year, when a deranged Bernie supporter opened fire on a baseball field, hitting Scalise and nearly killing him is a top contender to replace the unpopular, globalist Paul Ryan. From Politico Atop the Olympus TLP oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico, with one arm snicked around his crutches and the other gripping a handrail, Steve Scalise climbed gingerly up hundreds of stairs to the peak control room of a hulking oil rig 77 miles off the coast of Louisiana. By all accounts, Scalise, the House Majority Whip, shouldn't have been here. Doctors said he was millimeters away from death in June after a gunman's bullet tripped through his hip and pelvis, injuring internal organs during an early morning softball practice. Scalise only recently ditched his electric scooter and started walking again with crutches. Who's wearing the Fitbit? Scalise, donning navy coveralls and a yellow hard hat, joked as he neared the top, some 200 feet above water. Scalise's recovery has coincided with his fast-rising stature within the House Republican Conference. This time a year ago, he was seen as a dependable but unremarkable member of Paul Ryan's leadership team. Now the 52-year-old is being talked up as a possible successor to Ryan when the House Speaker retires. A cluster of House Republicans has privately encouraged Scalise to embrace his new star power and prepare a campaign for Speaker according to multiple GOP lawmakers. One member recently introduced Scalise to donors as the next Speaker of the House. And the talk bubbled to the surface this week when two GOP lawmakers, Reps. Mark Amada of Nevada and Mo Brooks of Alabama, vocalized what others have whispered privately for weeks. The rumor mill is that Paul Ryan is getting ready to resign in the next 30 to 60 days and that Steve Scalise will be the new Speaker, Amadai said. The 30 to 60 days part isn't true, according to Ryan's office and a host of other leadership sources. But people close to Scalise say he'd be interested when Ryan does retire and if Republicans keep the House this fall. He'd make a move, however, only if Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, Republican California, were not to run or fell short, Scalise's allies say. In an interview Tuesday in Louisiana's southernmost port, Scalise acknowledged his desire to lead the conference someday but said now isn't the time to discuss it. I wouldn't rule it out, Scalise said of a bid for speaker if the circumstances were right. Obviously, I've shown interest in the past at moving up. I've enjoyed being in leadership. I feel like I've had a strong influence on some of the things that we've done, and I've helped put together coalitions to pass a full repeal of Obamacare. He went on to say that he also worked closely with Ryan, McCarthy, and Ways and Means Chairman Kevin Brady on tax reform. I want to keep doing this, Scalise said. Scalise cautioned, however, that talk of Ryan's retirement are rumors and said for now he's focused on passing President Donald Trump's agenda and working to keep the House in GOP hands. It's easy to get drawn into the palace intrigue and speculation. But if you do that, you truly will lose focus on what your mission is, and that is working with President Trump to advance a conservative agenda, Scalise said. The stakes are way too high for us to lose sight of what we need to do right now.
Skalai's returned to the house last fall after several months in the hospital recovering from the shooting. But reminders of that day still follow him everywhere, including on Tuesday's oil rig tour. His purple crutches stood out against a maze of gray piping and still that make up the 40-story high shell rig called Olympus. He moved slowly as rig workers showed him and four fellow Republican lawmakers the massive drill bits and wells used to extract oil more than 22,000 feet below the ocean floor. Never far from his site was U.S. Capitol Police Special Agent David Bailey, the man who saved Scalise's life and, along with another agent, killed the gunman. During a roundtable discussion back on shore that afternoon, a room full of local business leaders erupted in applause when Scalise introduced Bailey to his constituents. Scalise doesn't have feeling in his left shin, and he can barely flex his left foot because of nerve damage caused by the bullet. His internal organs are still recovering, and he's expecting to undergo another surgery in April. In the interview, he talked about his three times a week physical therapy. His doctors have incorporated baseball, one of his favorite pastimes, into the recovery routine, though Scalise acknowledged that he probably won't be playing second base for the GOP team again this spring. It's hard to make lateral movements right now, but if the ball came to me right now, I could get it. I could make the throw to first base, without falling over, Scalise said, standing up and swooping down to demonstrate fielding an imaginary ground ball. Despite his impaired mobility, Scalise has tried to return to normal as quickly as possible. After an eight-hour surgery in January, he was supposed to go home to rest but instead went straight to the Capitol amid the fight over a government shutdown. In February, he started traveling again to raise money for fellow Republicans, as leaders are expected to do. During one of those recent events, Rep. Roger Williams of Texas introduced Scalise to his donors as the next speaker. Williams' chief of staff, Colby Hale, said the remark was lighthearted, but added that if and when Speaker Ryan decides it's time to no longer be speaker, Congressman Williams thinks Whip Scalise would be a natural leader to step up. The past nine years, Scalise has invited lawmakers to Louisiana to learn about offshore oil production that support his district's bayou economy. His guests this year included GOP reps. Mark Walker of North Carolina, Jody Arrington of Texas, John Curtis of Utah and Greg Gianford of Montana. Shell officials gave the members tours of what essentially operates as a mini-city on water, taking them through everything from the oil drilling process to the purification of salt water for drinking and life on the rig. Where's the karaoke room? Scalais said at one point when a rig dweller talked about how he spends his free time. Scalise's was plainly in good spirits showing off his home turf. When Arrington complained about a high-pitched noise during the helicopter ride on route to the rig, Scalais cracked that it was revenge for those in the cabin who voted against the recent omnibus package. Walker and Gian Ford opposed the measure. During lunch, he praised the rig cooks declaring that this is better than Rayburn House office building cafeteria food. Scalise also talked to his colleagues about coastal erosion, the types of crude oil his district exports to other countries and his desire to open up more of the Gulf to drilling. The members asked officials about regulations that hurt the industry. If Scalise was physically hurting after the long day of climbing, he didn't show it. I may be a little bit slower this year, he said but it felt good to be out there. We have been calling for Paul Ryan to step down since before President Trump took office. It's time for a change. What do you think of Scalise replacing Ryan? If not him, who else do you think would be a good replacement?